it equals the period starting date and that obviously that's not correct um, I wanted to find out what the get current period starting date was so the day util class which is the one that calculates a whole bunch of dates for us uh, can get the current period ending date can get the current period starting date can get the date with zero times can get the date with max times and also has a function that tells me whether a particular date is in the current pay period so these are very useful functions date util functions that I'm going to be using but the one that I'm interested in really is whether the period ending date of a timesheet is for this week or not <clears throat> so the only way I'm going to be able to know that is if it is in the current pay period so I need to know that the period ending date of that particular timesheet that I'm looking at is in the current pay period that's the real condition here <clears throat> it's not the starting date but is in current pay period what's in current pay period the timesheet period in date okay that's it unit tests for the day util so we had this really cool day util that we didn't have any unit tests for it so I had to create a day util test and I basically to test each one of the functions of day util I created in the setup of the test case I created a, a now date a last week date and a next week date okay and I will test each one of the functions like the get current period ending date when I call it and I get a period ending date I will make sure that the period ending date is a Sunday it has to be a Sunday because all the period ending dates in my system are going to be Sundays so I am going to assert equal that the day of that period ending date plus one that's a hack is equal to Sunday unfortunately Sunday in a, in a uh, Gregorian calendar is a one while a Sunday in a regular date Java date uh, is a zero so you have to you know get day equals zero for Sunday while Gregorian calendar Sunday equals one that's one of the Java handling that really sucks you know but anyway you have to work around it and then you will have to do something similar to create a test for the get current period starting date so the starting date should be a Monday so that's what we do we, we make sure that it's a Monday anyway we also have to test the fact that it's true that the date from last week is is before the period ending date of this current period and also that the date for next week is after the current period ending date so we have to assert that same thing for the starting date the starting date uh, which should be a Monday of this week whatever that Monday is should be before last week's and it should be after next week's um, also for get dates with zero time you know we're testing that after we call get day with zero time we're getting zero hours zero minutes and zero seconds so we have to assert that equal same with get day with max time get day with max time we're trying to get today's date 
but maxed with the uh, number of hour minutes and seconds so we have to assert that the hours are 23 that the minutes are 59 the seconds are 59 and then finally the test for the whether a date is in the current pay period uh, we have to assert that the time now is within the current pay period because remember time now is the current Gregorian calendar. When you say new Gregorian calendar, it's creating a date with the current system date and time. So we know that it's within the current pay period. We also know, for instance, that it's false. That last week's date falls within the current pay period. Or that next week's date falls within the current pay period. Those two are false. So if we run those tests, let's run those tests right now, unit tests, then we should get all green. Yep. All right. So now that we have finally created a unit tests for our um, our day util, we can actually uh, be able to test the fact that yes, what we want to do here is uh, test whether the current period ending date or the period ending date of that current timesheet, I should say, is within the current period. Functionality, let's take a look at the UI sketch. This functionality of approved timesheet is going to require on the front end a yes or no input and we're going to have to translate that yes or no input tags uh, into approve or disapprove status code of the timesheet so to massage that data we're going to that new value could be saved in the database as minutes okay so this very simple conversion has to be done also on the approve timesheets controller and we're going to call it the yes no property editor and we're going to have to register that editor in the init binder remember that's the method that actually binds or that initializes all the binding uh, so if you register a custom editor that's what it's going to use for every single string so every single string that is going to be uh, input into this form in the approve uh, timesheet controller will go through this yes no property editor so let's take a look at this yes no property editor what it, to see what it does yes it extends from the property editor support which means it overrides the get as text and the set as text let's see. oh I see if we have the timesheet that has a status code of A, which we know it's approved, right? So the value is the status code of um, of the timesheet, and it's equal, ignoring the, the case, obviously, if it's equal to approved, which means it's an A, then what we're going to present is we're going to present the new value yes. And we're going to assume, before we ask that, that it's going to be a no. So unless unless the timesheet is approved we will not present it as a yes on the front end so if it's disapproved if it's um, submitted that's it if it's a, if disapproved or just submitted the value will be no we're going to say no it's not approved but if it's if the status code of that timesheet is approved then we're going to present it as a yes. And that's the value that we're going to return, that we're going to present on the front end. Now, set as text is going to do the opposite. It's going to take a yes or no, and it's going to convert it into correct status code. So in this case, we're going to assume that the status code is pending. Okay, that's the first thing that we do. We're going to assume that the status code is pending, because that's typically uh, what every timesheet uh, status code is initially. And then we're going to ask whether the 
text being passed from the front end, remember from this one, whether the text that is being passed from the front end is a yes. If it's a yes, then we're going to set the new value. We're going to set the new value to be equal to timesheet approved, which is an A. Okay? Otherwise, if the text that is coming from the front end it's a no, then we're going to set the new value, status code of that timesheet, equal to disapprove, which is a D. So the outcome from here is going to be the status code of the timesheet will get modified, and it will get modified either with an A or a D. An A for a yes, a D for a no. Um, and that's it. And so we're going to set the value uh, to that new value. And, and that takes care of the massaging of the yes no property editor. Okay? So remember, every string, which in this case there's only two strings being input in this, in this uh, approved timesheets form this string or that string. Okay, every string will go through the yes/no property editor. All right. Now, finally, on the on submit. So when when the manager selects yes or no, approve, disapprove, and then clicks on send, the on submit will get executed. Okay, and basically what we want to do here is we want to first of all use the application security manager to get the employee out of the session right and get his email okay and that's going to be the email from which we're going to be sending remember we got to we got as soon as the manager approves or disapproves the timesheets each one of these guys will get an email saying your your timesheet was approved or disapproved and also the account manager so we need the email from who is it sending from? And that's all from you know whoever is logged in at the time. Also, <coughs> we are going to capture all these timesheets as a timesheet list wrapper. Remember, that's our command object, the one being passed as a parameter into the unsubmit. So we're going to have to cast that object into a timesheet list call it the app timesheets and then the app timesheets which we know it's a wrapper it has a getter so we can get all the list of timesheets so we're going to say get timesheets and we're going to put in here timesheets list of timesheets okay and then we're going to traverse through all those timesheets and what are we going to do each one we're going to tell the timesheet manager to save that particular timesheet okay so we're going to traverse timesheets each one is going to be called T, and what we're going to do with T is we're going to save it, tell the timesheet manager to save it. So basically, it's going to update the status code of that timesheet. Now, look at this. Then we ask, what's the status code of the timesheet? If it's equal to approved, so it just recently got approved, then we're going to send an approval email. And if it's not approved, then it's disapproved we're going to send a disapproval email and we're going to pass the email from address and also the timesheet okay so in here we have created the send approval and the send disapproval and they're almost identical except that the message is different in the send approval what we do is we already have an approval message set up Okay. This approval message, if you guys remember, it's a simple mail message that has, you know, the body, the subject. Let's take a look at it in the configuration. This stuff gets injected automatically. So in the configuration, we should be able to see an approval email message. Here it is. Approval email message basically has... Um, a subject, 
timesheet has been approved and a text saying hey timesheet is approved regards and that's it and we have a 2 in here which we don't really oh yeah we need it this 2 is by default the accounting email address okay so we need to send to accounting at least to accounting um, that email address that has been approved we're also going to have to add the email address of the employee and I guess that's what we're doing here next um, so in the approval message the set from we're going to set it as the email from email from the manager and then the set to we're going to create a new uh, array of strings and what we're going to put in there is we're going to put the approval message get to you know this is the accounting accountant's email address plus we're going to add the email address of the employee that owns that timesheet so you're going to tell the timesheet to get the employee who owns it and then to get the email and so basically you create a two uh, cedar array of strings. The first one is the um, the email of the accountant and the second one is the email of the employee. And then you just create a simple mail message with that and then send the message. And that sends the message of uh, the approval email message. And in a similar fashion we have the send this approval email which does the same thing but it has a different content. The disapproval email message says as the subject, timesheet is disapproved and timesheet is disapproved, please correct ours. Now in this case, in this case we are not sending an email to the accountant. Notice that we do not have in the two, uh, like in the approval email, in the disapproval we do not have a two with the email of the accountant. So. Um, that means that the accountant won't get spammed with all the disapprovals. That's basically what it means. Only the employee will be sent that email. Okay? So notice how easy it is to just, you know, once you create the specific functionality, you just inject stuff into the different controllers, and it's very easy. Now that we have separated all the concerns about ma selling e sending emails, how to, uh, how to uh, calculate date uh, requirements and all that stuff, it's very easy how to do the conversion from yes, no to approve and disapprove. Once you have all these concerns separate, then you or orchestrate them all into the controller to create something as beautiful as the approved timesheet controller. Um, or the approved timesheets functionality, I should say. Um, what else? Oh, the send message obviously is the one that uses the mail sender to send that message. So the mail sender is another one of those properties that get injected into the timesheet uh, approved timesheets controller. So let's take a look at the actual configuration of the approved timesheets controller. This is going to be the URL that will trigger it approved timesheets.htm and it will be handled by this bean okay now we need to be able to make it as a session form true so the form backing object doesn't get executed every time that that the timesheet that the approved timesheets controller is it's called okay um, the command class we know is the timesheet list right our wrapper the form view, that's where it goes when it's going to present the data, is the approved timesheets.jsp. So we're going to take a look at that JSP later on. And the success view, when you successfully approved your timesheets, it's going to go back to the staff hours. Remember, that's the one that shows the, um, the report for the staff hours. Um, and we also, oh, here it is. Here is the validator. So what kind of validation do we need to do on the controller? Um, before we go into that, we're injecting the timesheet manager, employee manager, the application security manager, 
the approval mess email message, the disapproval email message, and the mail sender. So, so we're injecting a whole bunch of stuff into timesheet list into the timesheets controller. So, what is the validator? All right. Notice that nowhere in here in the controller, nowhere in the controller, mentioning a validator. Nothing whatsoever. Okay. But we are going to inject it. This validator, we're going to inject it. Okay? And the approved timesheets controller will get this validator injected into it. And it's going to be represented by this bean. Okay? Which is a very simple bean. In fact, it's just represented by one class. Nothing gets injected into it. So let's take a look at what the approved timesheets validator looks like. And obviously it's going to have to implement from an, a spring um, from a spring interface called the validator, which means that it's going to have to implement two specific functions, or I should say one function and one method. The function is called supports that tells me exactly what kind of type, object type, this validation is for. And also, it's going to have a method called validate, which is the actual method that gets called to validate the object. Okay? So, in this case of the approved timesheets validator, the class that we're going to support, obviously, is going to be the timesheet list. Okay? Because this is the object that we're trying to validate in this specific form. Remember, we're passing the form back an object. The command class is the timesheet list, our wrapper. So that's the class that supports, that, that this validator supports. Okay? So uh, basically, supports is going to have a class parameter, and we just going to make sure that the class is equal to timesheet list. If it's not equal to timesheet list, then this validator will not handle any validation whatsoever. Okay? Um, and then what kind of validation is it going to do under on, on this timesheet list? Well, timesheet list is going to be passed as an object to the validate method. Okay? And so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to cast it into timesheet list because we know it's going to be a timesheet list. We call it the app timesheets. And then we're going to get all the timesheets, the list of timesheets, from that wrapper. We're going to call it the timesheets. And then we're going to make sure, first of all, that if it's equal to null or if the size of this list is less than or equal to zero, we're not going to validate anything. Obviously, there's nothing in there. There are no timesheets whatsoever shown in this form. Okay? So we're not going to validate anything. But if on the contrary it's the timesheets is not equal to null and the size is greater than or equal greater than zero, uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to traverse through all the timesheets and each one we're going to call it T. And we're going to make sure, first of all, that there is a status code. So if the status code is equal to null or the status code is the length of the status code is less than one, then we know something is wrong with the status code of that timesheet. Okay? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna um basically reject through an error. So we're gonna call the errors reject and we're gonna pass a key val a key um message, string call error approve timesheets invalid invalid approve okay and basically what string is going to do is it's going to convert this key into some kind of meaningful error message and it's going to display it in the page okay now how does this message get translated into a uh, i mean this key string gets translated into a meaningful message. 
then we're going to have to introduce the concept of the messages and the resources. Um, every spring project will have, and in this case it will have it under the source folder, will have a messages.properties file. Notice that this messages.properties have a key, an equal sign, and then a value. All these kind of pairs. Okay? So it's going to have key equals value, key equals value. And sometimes there will be like parameters being passed into here. And parameters are um, represented by uh, a number surrounded by the curly brackets or curly braces. Okay? So these will get replaced somehow by some value that you pass on. So basically in this case, the error approved timesheets invalid approve error approved timesheets invalid approve will get translated into invalid timesheet status entered. Okay? Now imagine that you have a messages that properties in English with all the messages in English. And then you have another messages that properties with a different language. So these messages could be in Spanish, French, Greek, Russian, Hindi, I mean whatever language. And it doesn't really matter to the application doesn't really matter what language is going to present the message because from the application perspective you are just sending a key for that error a key for that error and that key will be used to find the actual error message that is going to be presented on the JSP now in order to uh, tell Spring about messages that properties. We're going to have to go obviously into our configuration and right here in the resource bundle section, we're going to have to create a being called a message source. And the message source message source is going to be a specific Spring framework class called the resource bundle message source that basically you're going to tell what is the name of the properties file to use in order to present the messages. And in this case, you can pass actually a whole list of files if you need to. So you're going to have messages in English and messages in French and messages in Spanish and messages in every single language, and each one will have its own um, file with the same keys, but translated into that particular uh, language. And so in this case the property base, base names uh, is just a list of one member and the one member is messages. So what is what Spring is going to do automatically is going to take that messages and append dot properties to it and it's going to default to the English English underscore US, that's the locale that we are working on right now. So this messages properties is going to be the default. Now if we need one in, in French for instance, then we're going to have a messages dot fr underscore fr for French in France and that properties and then similar for messages dot um, sp underscore es for um, Spanish in Spain for instance dot properties etc so that's the whole idea you know to to be able to provide um, property files for every single language that the application is going to support and from the pers from the application perspective uh, you just pass key key values to 
to the errors and he will know how to handle it. Alright, so that's as far as the validator. So basically supports the timesheet list and it's going to validate that the status code of every single timesheet in that timesheet list is good. That it's not null and that the length is not less than one. Otherwise, the, we know that something is, is wrong with the timesheet list. From the configuration perspective, all you have to do is inject a property called validator. Okay? And that's it. The controller doesn't need to do anything about uh, your specific controller doesn't need to know anything about the the validator or you don't have to do anything specific with the validator you just inject the validator into the to the controller and it will take care of making sure that the object the form backing object uh, gets validated so let's take a look at the actual approved timesheets JSP This is where we have the save changes button, where we have the reset button, and where we have the cancel button. The cancel bu button on and click goes back to the staff hours. The reset button on and click resets basically the form, it's a JavaScript uh, functionality, resets the form back to its original st status or stage, um, and then save changes is this the unsubmit. This, this is the one that actually executes the unsubmit. Um, what do we have on the front end? Here it is. So on the front end, remember we're going to have the command button, I'm sorry, the command object is going to be timesheet list, our wrapper. Um, so we're going to have to get the timesheets in it. And those are going to be our items. So we're going to do a for loop over that list of timesheets. And each particular one we're going to call it timesheet. And basically what we're going to do here is we're going to provide the employee name, the timesheet employee name, right here, comma, the timesheet period ending date, the timesheet period ending date. And that whole thing is going to be a link. And it's going to be a link to print hours so that we can actually click on that link and go to the print timesheet. As you guys remember, that's what it, the whole objective of that is. And also, we're going to have to present the total number of hours for that timesheet. And so the way to do that is we tell the timesheet to get the total minutes, and we divide it by 60. So we're doing the, the minutes massaging on the JSP side. We're going to have an incrementer, very similar to the staff hours, if you remember. We're going to have the incrementer variable which will keep track of all the uh, hours right here and then we're going to display it at the end and then we're going to show the status code the status code of the timesheet as for submitted, A for approved, etc. Then, this is the part that binds, remember spring bind, we're going to bind just the status code of the timesheet. But you're going to say, wait a minute, which timesheet? It's a whole list of timesheets. Which one are you talking about? Well, that's why I'm introducing you to the concept of the index. In this case, since we are dealing with a whole list of timesheets, each timesheet will have a place in index in the list. So the yes no in here belongs to the time to this particular timesheet, the one with index one. 
etc. And so in this case, as we are building the bind for this particular timesheet, the only way that we're going to know whose status we're talking about is by indexing. It's called the tstatus.index. And the tstatus, this tstatus, um, comes from uh, a variable. It's the name of exported scoped variable for the status of this iter iteration. So remember, we're going to iterate over the list of timesheets. Okay, each one is going to be called timesheet, and t status is going to be the the actual um, name of the exported scope variable for the status of this iteration. So the object exported is of type uh, loop tag status, which basically it tells you what's the status of that particular um, variable in the collection. And indeed, t status dot index will tell me what's the index of that timesheet within the list of timesheets from the command. Okay, and and that's what we're going to bind to. And in fact, in a few minutes, we're going to take a look at the actual HTML and see. Uh, what does this translate into HTML? What kind of HTML this translates into? Okay. Now it's going to be an input tag, obviously, because we're going to expect some imp input. It's going to be of type radio, and the value is going to be yes. The value is going to be yes if if the status that value status rem remember refers to whatever you're putting in the path here. So if the value of this status code of the timesheet is equal to yes, we're going to check we're gonna, the, the radio button yes, we're going to check it, meaning yes, it's approved. Okay, And this is what we're going to be showing, yes, space, space. And then right next to it, so right next to the yes button, there is a no button. And the no is also an input tag of type radio. The value is going to be no. Okay. And notice that the names of these two are the same. Status expression refers to you know the name of this guy. So they're both radio buttons called the same because they have to act together. Status expression is, is their name. Um, and then if the value the value of the status code of the timesheet is equal to no, then we're going to check the no. So either it's a yes or a no, and only one of them will be checked. Okay, And that's the bind that we're providing in this form. Just the bind to the status code. Provide yes value or no value, which gets through the yes no property editor gets translated into approve or disapprove. So it's pretty slick the way that th this is done on the front end all the way to the back end. Um, and that's it. That's pretty much it. So let's take a look at let's take a look at this um, functionality running. Let's make sure that this is looks good. Um, let me see. So I'm going to sign in as Theresa Walker. These are Theresa Walker's uh, timesheets. So she gets, since she's a manager, she gets a staff hours report menu, which the other guys don't which takes us to the staff hours report. We've seen this one. And then she sends a manager, she gets to another link called the approved timesheets. So she clicks on the approved timesheets and here is the approved timesheets. You know, all the timesheets she can look at them individually. And then she can select yes or no. 
So we're not going to approve Ajay Kumar's March 28th timesheet, and we're not going to approve Mike Dover's March 28th timesheet. And all the rest are going to be approved. And we're going to send, and then we go back to staffing hours. So if we take a look at the database, Um, March 28th for Mike Dover, employee ID 1, notice that there's a D for disapproved. And March 28th for employee ID 2, which is a J. Kumar, there's a D for disapproved. Okay? And it attempted to send an email from this email address which is Theresa Walker's email address to the individual employee that got their emails either uh, I mean their timesheets either approved or disapproved okay so that's how the approved timesheets work let's go back to approved timesheets notice that no and no are set here. So now we're going to um, change them to yes. So a J. Kumar's March 28th timesheet and Mike Dover's March 28th timesheet will get approved. So we're going to send it. And then we go back to the database, refresh, and now notice that they're both approved and approved. All right. So last functional requirement that we are supposed to do for this week, the timesheet approval. Okay?